Okay, so uh, one of the proofs I would like to share with you uh, that relates to the hybridization of um, orbitals is where does the 109.5 degree bond angle come from? As far as the other angles are concerned, most people have no problem understanding 90 degree bond angles or 120, uh, but 109.5 seems a little mysterious. So I've taken the time to draw you a molecule that's a tetrahedral that has sp3 hybridization, like a methane molecule. And one of the ways to show the bond angles is to draw the molecule inside of a cube. So if you want to do the same diagram, what you do uh, to draw a cube that's in the correct perspective, make a square, find the center of the first square, and draw another square of the same side, starting from the corner of that um, from that corner, start in the corner of the second square in the middle of the first square, and then you connect all the corners together. So that's how you draw a cube in the right perspective. And then what you do is you draw a methane molecule with the carbon atom center at the center of this cube. And we're going to, we're going to assume that the cube is two units high. And you'll notice that the hydrogen atoms are going to be at opposite diagonals. So on this top plane, you'll have a hydrogen atom at opposite diagonals, and then if you were to rotate, uh, you would have hydrogen atoms at the opposite diagonals on the bottom. That's what a tetrahedron looks like. That's what a tetrahedral molecule looks like. It fits inside of a cube, and it touches opposite diagonals with the hydrogen atoms. And then what I'd like you to do is draw a line um, from the center of the bottom of the cube, of, of the cube to the center of the line on the outside edge. And then do the same, draw another line to this corner from the center of, of this plane. And what we'll be able to deduce from that is that the corner, the edges of this triangle are going to be both one unit long because it represents exactly half the distance, which is the length of one edge. Now if the edge length is two, half of that distance is going to be one. So if you go from the center of the bottom of the cube to the edge, that distance is one. And if you go from this, the middle of this edge to that corner, it's also going to be one. It just allows us to deduce that using Pythagoras, because this is a 90 degree angle. It doesn't look like a 90 degree angle, but it is. It's just drawn in perspective. Uh, using Pythagoras' theorem, we can say that one squared plus one squared is equal to x squared. That would be the hypotenuse here. And that gives us a value of root two, or x. Once we find the length of x, we can drop a line from the center of that cube to the center of the bottom of the cube, and that will be a distance of one because it represents half the height of the cube. And we can say again using Pythagoras because this is a 90 degree angle that one squared plus x squared is equal to the hypotenuse squared, which we call y. So we set that up here, we solve for y, we find out that y is equal to root 3 in this cube that is two units high. That allows us to find this angle, which is, the, which is basically half the angle represented by uh, the angle between the two hydrogen atoms. So we're trying to find twice theta. I called, it, I called this angle theta, and it's a similarly constructed angle theta on the other side of the cube. Those two angles theta added together equals the full angle which represents the bond between two hydrogen atoms. So to find out theta, we used x over y, which is opposite over hypotenuse. Opposite over hypotenuse gives you the sine of the angle. Sine theta equals opposite over hypotenuse. Root 2 over 3, over root 3. When we find the angle, we find out that theta is equal to 54.73, but that's half of the angle. So by doubling theta, we find out the total angle, which is 109.47. And that's where we get 109.5. I wrote QED here to symbolize the Latin phrase quas in a demonstrand of meaning. Thus, what we were trying to prove has been proven. Now, to continue, uh, when we hybridize orbitals, uh, we have to begin with the premise that electrons, bonding electrons, and lone pairs will repel each other. And the, the repulsions, these repulsions dictate the geometry of the molecules they compose. So if you have two um, 
things attached to a central atom. That means a SN stands for steric number. It means there are two things attached to a central atom with no lone pairs. Uh, then the uh, central atom has to be sp hybridized and it's going to be linear. An example of a molecule that has that kind of hybridization is uh, carbon in CO2. If there are three things attached to the central atom with no lone pairs, it's going to be sp2 hybridized, meaning an s orbital and two p orbitals combined, they become of the same energy and they turn into three orbitals. So the s and the p combined to form three orbitals, but all of them equivalent energy. And because they're hybrid, they're called sp2 orbitals. And because they're equivalent, and because the electrons seek to be as far apart as they can on the, on the atom, on the central atom, you get a trigonal planar molecule. Uh, boron trifluoride is, ex is an example of a molecule that has a trigonal planar geometry. And the bond angles in this are 120. In, in uh, carbon dioxide, it would be 180. If you have three things attached to a central atom, of which one of them is a lone pair, it's still sp2 hybridized, but now the molecule is called bent, because you don't actually see, and I forgot to put the lone pair here, the molecule, uh, when you, when you um, draw the molecule, you'll draw a lone pair, but if you were to do uh, an X-ray crystallographic analysis of it, the lone, the lone pairs don't show up. They don't diffract X-rays the way bonding pairs do. So what you do see is a bent molecule. And sulfur dioxide is an example of a bent geometry. And the angle here is slightly less than 120. We'll find out that uh, lone pairs tend to be rather fat, and they bend down the uh, lone pairs as a result. If we have four things attached to a central atom with zero lone pairs, it's going to be sp3 hybridized. A 1s orbital combines with three p orbitals to form four equivalent energy orbitals called sp3 because they're hybrid orbitals. Methane is an example of an sp3 hybridized molecule, and the geometry is tetrahedral. And here we've drawn the methane molecule. Notice how these bond lines mean that the uh, bond line is in the same plane as the, as the blackboard, as the whiteboard. And this hydrogen atom is coming out at you. This hydrogen atom is going behind the plane of the board. So the, you draw them with hashes to show that it's going behind. And you draw with a triangle to show that it's sticking out. And if you draw with a line, it's in the plane. Uh, if you have four things attached to a central atom, of which one of them is a lone pair, you still have sp3 hybridization, you have four equivalent orbitals, uh, but then the molecule is called pyramidal. Why? Because that lone pair, again, doesn't show up. Ammonia is a classical example of, uh, of a pyramidal geometry. So it looks like a stool, and the lone pair can be seen to be sticking up. It looks like a little ghost. Uh, the, the bond angles are like a tetrahedron except they're slightly compressed by the presence of this lone pair. So their, reason, their bond angles between these hydrogen atoms is going to be slightly less than 109.5. If you have four things attached to a central atom, two of them being electron and lone pairs, you get sp3 hybridization. The molecule is called angular planar. Water has that structure. See the two lone pairs? The, and again, the bond angle is even more restricted than what you see between hydrogen atoms because now there's two lone pairs pushing down and this bond angle is in the vicinity of uh, 105, I believe. If five things are attached to a central atom with no lone pairs, then we begin to involve the d orbitals. So we get one s orbital, three p orbitals, and a d orbital. It forms five equivalent orbitals that are sp3d hybridized, and the geometry is called trigonal bipyramidal. Phosphorus pentachloride has that geometry. And when you draw a molecule that is a trigonal bipyramid, you have three chlorine atoms, in this case, uh, three atoms in the plane, in the same plane, forming a triangle of sorts, one above and one below. So that's how you show the, the two sticking out for, uh, forward. This one is pointing behind the plane of the board. This one is pointing straight up. This chlorine atom is pointing straight down. So it looks like two triangular-based pyramids stuck base to base when you think of the geometry of the molecule. If you were to draw lines connecting everything, you would see it more clearly as a um, triangle-based pyramid. I haven't drawn it very well, but you can see how. Um, it's like two 
two triangle based pyramids. I'd have to redraw it to show you more, uh, more effectively. Now, if you have five things attached to the central atom, and one of them being a lone pair, it's sp3 dehybridized, that looks like a sawhorse. So, what happens is the lone pair. Uh, to maintain that angle of 120 degrees, which is the best, the longest distance apart you can get, will go on the equatorial plane of the molecule. So what you'll have is, uh, again, it would look like a trigonal bipyramid, except the lone pair is, a, is located equatorially. One fluorine atom goes up, one goes down in a sulfur uh, tetrafluoride. And uh, because you don't see the lone pair, the molecule looks like a seesaw. Here are the feet of the seesaw, and there's the seesaw itself that can go back and forth. So they call it a sawhorse or a seesaw-shaped molecule. The next possibility has five things attached to the central atom with two lone pairs. It's also sp3 dehybridized, and the molecule ends up being T-shaped. Iodine trichloride is a molecule that is T-shaped. The two lone pairs end up equatorially. And what you see is the up and the chlorine atom going up, chlorine atom going down, and there's only one sticking out in the middle. So the molecule looks like a T. That's the name. Five things attached to the central atom with three lone pairs is again sp 3 dehybridized. The three lone pairs end up equatorially. Because they're not visible, the molecule looks linear. One fluorine atom up, one fluorine atom down. Xenon difluoride is an example of such a molecule. Now, you might be scandalized by the fact that you see xenon as a central atom, but they, these kind of compounds have been forced to form, although typically uh, noble gases don't form compounds easily. You won't find them in nature, but they can be forced to form under special conditions. If you have six um, things attached to a central atom with no lone pairs, we invoke yet another d orbitals, so now it's s, 3p orbitals, 2d orbitals. It forms six equivalent orbitals uh, hybridized between sp and d, sp, 3d, two hybridized orbitals. Octahedrals are what you get as a molecular shape. Now, when you think of octahedral, you think of eight. Um, it helps you to imagine it as a cube. A cube has eight points, four above and four below, and that's what the molecule will fit inside of it, it's inside of a cube. Sulfur hexafluoride is an octahedral atom, an uh, octahedral molecule. The bond angles between all the um, fluorine atoms is 90 degrees. It's always 90 degrees. So you get four equatorial, one above, one below. No matter how you flip the molecule, you get the same symmetry. Then uh, if you have six things attached to a central atom with one lone pair, it's still sp3d2 hybridized, and then now you call it square pyramidal. Um, iodine pentafluoride has a square pyramidal shape. See the lone pair here is now jutting below. You have a plane composed of four fluorine atoms and one fluorine atom sticking up. It looks like a square based pyramid in its geometry. If you have six things attached to a central atom with two lone pairs, it's again sp3d2 hybridized. Now it's called square planar because the two lone pairs are one above and one below the plane, so you get a square. Xenon tetrafluoride has this geometry. So the premise of Vesper theory is that electron pairs repel and that lone pairs repel more. So whenever you're constructing your molecule, whenever you're deciding the geometry of the molecule based on the Lewis structure that you've drawn, be aware of the fact that lone pair lone pair interactions are higher energy than lone pair bonding pair interactions, which are higher energy than bonding pair bonding pair interactions. We'll see a little um, more of this in the later examples.